The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Well, in the last program, we were talking about the similarities and the differences between the early church, just after the crucifixion of Jesus, and the Pharisees, or the religious Jews, the really devout and religious Jews. There were great similarities, and to start, the differences were not obvious to them. The crucifixion had, in fact, been the protest of the Jew against an isopoly of faith or against the equal rights of citizens in different communities. And from that moment, the fate of the nation was decided and the religion of the Jews and the Jewish people was to kill it. When the temple burst into flames, however, Christianity had already spread its wings, gone out to conquer an entire world. So a separation had already taken place, a major separation by AD 70. Now, as might have been expected, and as was evidently designed by their divine master, the last point on which the Galilean apostles attained to clearness of view and consistency of action was the fact that the Mosaic law was to be superseded, even for the Jew, by a wider revelation. And it is probable that this truth in all its fullness was never fully apprehended by all the apostles. It is doubtful whether humanly speaking it would ever have been grasped by any of them if their powers of insight had not been quickened in God's appointed method by fresh lessons which came to them through the intellect and the faith of men who had been brought up in larger views. And one such man was Stephen. And the obliteration of natural distinctions is not a part of the divine method. Uh, God is not in the cookie cutter business. He's not out to make us all dead alike. If that were the case, we'd be like the Borg on Star Wars. We'd just be one of five or one of 5,000 or five million. The Lord does not intend to obliterate natural distinctions. The inspiration of God never destroys the individuality of those holy souls which it has made into sons of God and prophets. People say, will we know each other in heaven? Yes, you will still be you in heaven, a perfected you, but you will be you. You are what you are and you are unique and you are the best you, that, you ever, that, that there ever will be. There are, as Paul so earnestly tried to impress upon the infant churches, diversities of gifts, diversities of ministrations, diversities of operation, though it is the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God, who works all things in all. Well, the Hellenistic or Greek training of a Stephen and a Saul prepared them for the acceptance of lessons which nothing short of an express miracle could have made immediately intelligible and understandable to a Peter or a James. It was because of the training that Paul had and Stephen had in the understandings of a different culture and a different world, namely the Greek world, that enabled them to see things that Peter and James never could have seen except God had worked an express miracle in their life. Now, the relation of the law to the gospel had been exactly one of those subjects on which Jesus, in accordance with divine purpose, had spoken of with a certain reserve. Now, the Lord was not an iconoclast. 
He doesn't come along, his function is not to destroy altars and destroy temples and destroy people in a flash. Or oh, he's going to change them, yes, but he's not going to do it in a split second. And the mission of Jesus had been to found a kingdom, not to promulgate a theology. We need to remember that. The mission of Jesus was to found a kingdom, not to put forward a theology. Jesus had died not to formulate a system, but to redeem a race. What race? The race of men. That's why Jesus died, not to formulate a system. And the work of Jesus had been not to construct the dogmas of formal creeds, but to purify the soul of man by placing him in immediate relation to the Father in heaven. And it required many, many years for Jewish converts to understand the meaning of the saying of Jesus that, quote, he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Its meaning could indeed only become clear in the light of other sayings of which they had overlooked the force. Now, the apostles had seen Jesus obedient to the law. They had seen him worship in the temple and in the synagogues and had accompanied him in his journeys to the feast. He had never told them in so many words that the glory of the law, like the light which lingered on the face of Moses, was to be done away with. If he had told them that, that would have been it. They couldn't have stood it. They had failed to comprehend the ultimate tendency and significance of his words and actions respecting the Sabbath, respecting outward observances, respecting divorce, respecting the future universality of spiritual worship. They remembered doubtless what he had said about the permanence of the yard and horn of a letter in the law, but they had not recognized that the assertion of the preeminence of the moral over ceremonial duties is one which is unknown to law itself. World missionary evangelism is involved in feeding people. Yet there are so many different ways to accomplish this. One of these is through agricultural missions. World missionary evangelism has a long history of helping people establish farms. How do you do this? We well, provide them, first of all, with the knowledge it takes to grow crops. We're doing this right now in places like Africa, and we've done it in India and other spots all around the globe. Farming provides food to poor people. It teaches self-sufficiency, and it supports ongoing mission. As a matter of fact, one of our farms in India right now provides food that helps us feed our children in a nearby children's home. You can give a gift that will help us purchase a farm, provide farm tools, or even buy seed. You can also get involved in livestock farming. Right now, we need flocks of chickens, pigs, pairs of milk goats, milk cows, or even water buffalo. They offer opportunities for these people to sell products at local markets and then buy needed things to feed their family. Yes, agricultural missions are one of the most important tools world missionary evangelism has in reaching the lost and needy all over the globe. To get involved in helping us with this vital mission, go to our website at www.wme.org and look for Gifts for Communities. segment, we talked about how the Lord Jesus led his disciples into a much deeper comprehension and understanding of the law. He led them into an understanding of the spirit 
of the law. Now, they had not seen that his fulfillment of the law had consisted in its spiritualization, that he had not only extended to infinitude the range of its obligations, but had derived their authority from deeper principles and surrounded their fulfillment with divine sanctions. Now, I want to hes pause here and say something. I understand that in the Holy Land, in Israel, among Jewish men, pornography is a major, major problem. But the position of the Jewish man is that there's nothing in the law of Moses against it. But we don't have to have anything in the law of Moses, any chapter and verse, to know it's wrong and to know how destructive it is. Jesus was causing the disciples to see that there was a much higher comprehension and understanding and motivation for the law than they had understood. And the disciples had never observed how much was involved in the emphatic quotation by Christ of a passage in Hosea, quote, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. They were not ripe for the conviction that to attach primary importance to Mosaic regulations after they had been admitted into the kingdom of the heaven was to fix their eyes on a waning star while the dawn was gradually broadening into boundless day. Well, this brings us to Stephen. And about the early ministry of Stephen, we aren't told very much in the book of Acts. But its immense importance has become clearer in the light of subsequent history. Now, I don't think many Christians realize the impact that Stephen has had on the Christian world. And it is probable that Stephen himself can never have formed the remotest conception of the vast results, results among millions of Christians through centuries of progress, which in God's providence should arise from the first clear statement of those truths which he was the first to see. And had he done so, he would have been still more thankful for the ability with which he was inspired to support them and for the holy courage which prevented him from quailing for an instant under the storm of violence and hatred which his words awakened. What it was that took Stephen on an occasion into the synagogue of the Jewish Hellenists, we do not know. May have been the same missionary zeal which afterwards carried uh, to so many regions a young man of Tarsus, who at this time was among Stephen's ablest opponents. All that the scripture tells us is that, quote, there arose some of the synagogue which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and those of Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. That's all we're told. Stephen got into an argument in these synagogues. And the way that sentence is, is put together is so obscure that it's impossible to tell whether we are meant to understand that the opponents of Stephen were first the members of one synagogue which united these widely scattered elements or of five synagogues or of three synagogues, namely the synagogue of the freedmen, the synagogue of the Africans, the synagogue of the Asiatic Hellenists, or thirdly, two distinct synagogues, one of which was frequented by the Hellenists of Rome and Greece and Alexandria, and the other by those of Cilicia and proconsular Asia. So we're not exactly what synagogue or synagogues Stephen was in when he got into this argument. It would be interesting to know because it would throw additional light on the subject. 
So we'll simply have to settle for the fact that he got into an argument. Now, the number of synagogues in Jerusalem was so large <coughs> that there's no difficulty in believing that each of these bodies had their own separate places of religious meeting. In other words, there were divisions among the Jews as a people and among believers, Jewish believers as a people. Um, in the 20th century, Jerusalem, there were separate synagogues of the Spanish Sephardim, the Dutch, and the German and Polish Ashkenazim. Now, the freedmen, the, the, the synagogue of the freedmen may have been the descendants of those Jews whom the Roman Pompey had sent captive to Italy. And Jews were to be counted by the myriads in Asia and in Alexandria and in the cities of Asia. But to us, the most interesting of all these Greek-speaking Jews, a little bit outside the circumference of middle or central Judaism, was Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus, beyond all reasonable doubt, was a member of the synagogue of the Cilicians, because he was from Cilicia. And in that case, he must not only, that is Paul, this is very important, must not only have taken his part in the arguments with Stephen, in those arguments which followed the earnest exhortations of Stephen, but as a scholar of Gamaliel and a zealous Pharisee, Paul must have occupied a prominent position as an uncompromising champion of the tradition of the fathers. In other words, said all that to say this, that Paul and Stephen doubtless encountered each other in dispute and in argument before he was stoned. World missionary evangelism began when John E. Douglas Sr. accepted the challenge of caring for six orphan children in India. From this act of love sprang a work that has grown to include children's homes, schools, leper clinics, vocational and agricultural education, disaster relief, feeding programs, drilling water wells, and building churches. And at the heart of all of WME's work has been living out the Great Commission to take the news of salvation through Jesus to everyone we meet. As World Missionary Evangelism's work has grown from the initial effort to save six children in India to establishing mission projects across the globe. If you would prefer to mail in your gift, send it to WME, Post Office Box 660800. That's 660800, Dallas, Texas 75266. program or the last segment of this program we were talking about the fact that highly likely in fact absolutely positively certain I think that Paul and Stephen must have confronted each other in argument in the synagogues that's where they first met because one of the synagogues in which Stephen got into an argument was the synagogue of the Cilicians and Paul was from Cilicia. Now, the Saul of this period must have been widely different from that Paul 
uh, the slave of Jesus Christ, whom we know so well, yet the main features of his personality must have been the same. Paul was aggressive. Paul was confrontational. Paul was combative. Paul was intelligent. Paul liked to fight. That's just the whole fact of the matter. The Lord would take that later and use it to advance the church. Paul was not a shrinking violet by any means. But Paul could not have failed to recognize the moral beauty, the dauntless courage, the burning passion latent in the tenderness of Stephen's character. Now, the white ashes of a religion which had smoldered into formalism lay thickly scattered over Paul's own heart, but the fire of genuine sincerity burned below. That's a, a feature of Paul. And trained as he had been for years in the minutia of rabbinic teaching, he had not so far grown old in a deadening system as to mistake the painted burial cloths of a mummy for the grace and the flush of a healthy life. In other words, Paul knew Stephen was for real. And while Paul listened to Stephen, he surely must have felt the contrast between a dead theology and a living faith. It's the difference between listening to somebody preach a sermon and hearing somebody that's got a living experience and fire in their being. Between a kindling inspiration and a barren exegesis, Paul could see. Between a minute analysis of unimportant ceremonials and a preaching that stirred the inmost depths of the troubled heart, Paul could see. And even the rage which is often intensified by the unconscious rise of an irresistible conviction could not wholly prevent him from seeing that these Christian preachers of a gospel which he disdained as a horrible superstition, he could see they had found in Christ the secret of a light and a joy and a love and a peace compared with which his own condition was that of someone who was chained indissolubly to a corpse. They were alive and he was tied to something that was dead. And we catch but a single glimpse of these furious controversies. And their immediate effect was the triumph of Stephen in argument. The Hellenists were unable. How do we know that Stephen won the argument? Because of what they did to him. If he hadn't overcome them in argument, he wouldn't have been stoned. But the fact that he was superior in argument and triumphed over them resulted in his being stoned. And the Hellenists were unable to withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. Now, disdainful rabbinists were, at, uh, were amazed and disgusted to find out that he with whom they now had to deal, namely Stephen, was no rude provincial from Galilee, no illiterate fisherman, no humble person from a lake, no tax gatherer, but Stephen was one who had been trained in the culture of the heathen cities as well as in the learning of Jewish communities. He was a disputant who could meet them with their own weapons and speak Greek as fluently as they could speak Greek. In other words, Stephen is not the ordinary believer that they're having to deal with. This man is trained, he is educated, he is polished, he is experienced, he's a rhetorician, he knows how to argument. And steeped in centuries of prejudice, ingrained with traditions of which the truth had never been questioned, the 
the Jews must have imagined they would gain an easy victory over Stephen and at least convince a man of intelligence how degrading it was for him to accept a faith on which, from the full height of their own ignorance, they complacently looked down. And it must have been very discomforting for them to find out that what they had now to face was not a mere personal testimony. You know, you can argue with a testimony and they can set a testimony contemptuously aside. But now they're faced with a man with arguments based on premises which they themselves admitted, enforced by methods which they recognized and illustrated by a learning they could not surpass and how bitter must have been their rage when they heard doctrine subversive of their most cherished principles maintained with a wisdom which differed not only in degree but even in kind from the loftiest attainments of their firm, foremost rabbis, even of those whose merits had been regarded by the flattering titles of rooters of the mountains and glories of the law. So now the Jews are confronting a different type of character. Said that in World War II, the Germans were used to fighting Russian peasants, but one day they met a different Russian army from the Siberian frontier. Well, the Jews met a different soldier in Stephen. Just as it is in America, the key to escaping poverty is education. World Missionary Evangelism has long recognized the importance of education and has emphasized it to the children that we save via our child sponsorship programs and food for hunger programs. We have established schools and these schools provide the basic education these children need. World Missionary Evangelism also needs books and supplies. Children have to have school uniforms in many nations just to attend schools. How can you get involved? You can begin right now by supporting programs at World Missionary Evangelism that emphasize education.